Welcome friends to this uh, final webinar of 2020 in, in our series on media response to crises. So this is a 13 part uh, series organized by Press Club Kolkata in collaboration with the UNICEF office for West Bengal. And we've completed seven webinars and today is our eighth uh, webinar in the series. And today's topic is infodemic, fact checking and challenge of so social media. And we're delighted to have two very accomplished and distinguished media educators of, of the country. We have uh, Professor Dr. Minal Chatterjee, uh, the Regional Director and Professor, Indian Institute of Mass Communication, Dhenkanal. And we have Dr. Moshumi Vadacharya. Uh, she's an Associate Professor at the uh, Center for Mass Communication, Bishwa Bharati. Uh, without wasting any time, I would hand over to our Honorable Press Club uh, President, uh, Sri Srinashi Shur, to kindly welcome the guests and to introduce the topic of the day. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. Uh, welcome to uh, Professor Chatterjee and Professor Bhattacharya, and welcome to uh, Shuchurita Bardhan, ma'am, and uh, obviously our uh, host, uh, Dr. Pandey. And welcome to all the participants. As I always say, without the participants, uh, this effort is uh, fruitless. So we require your support. We require you to be there. I am personally delighted to have two eminent speakers of the day because of the fact that uh, both of them are, are quite, uh, I was quite fortunate to be knowing both of them in various capacities. And I have full respect that they will do justice to the topic. The topic is very close to the heart of the media practitioners as well as media academicians and media students because of the fact that uh, you know, we have come across, at least I have come across the word infodemic very recently when uh, we were covering pandemic. It was the WHO director general first spoke about that. Info, they are bothered about infodemic as uh, strongly as they are bothered about the pandemic itself. They said that even more because pandemic moves uh, in a speed, but infodemic moves in a faster speed than pandemic. There are a lot of information these days present in social media otherwise and another reason from the official uh, you know organizations uh, we have seen that their briefings have changed whether this needs to be done then they changed it to no that is not the correct thing the the, the, the other things to be done and etc cetera, etc cetera. so the responsibility of the journalists is to disseminate the correct information especially in a pandemic situation now how do we do it Firstly, we must know that the strength of our source, where from we are collecting the information, we need to quote the source. And then secondly, we need to cross check. There are uh, FC and fact check, checking networks, uh, the tools which are present here. I think our speakers will um, dwell on that. And uh, I can only say that uh, Press Information Bureau, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting Government of India has started a fact checking network regarding the pandemic news and um, anybody can give it as far as the government institutions and departments like family welfare, health and family welfare, public health and ICMRs and etc. If the, the news is not wrong, they will come back and let you know. Now, we have to work against time, the journalists, that immediately we have to disseminate if we are in a social media, if we are in television or maybe we get, a, get the day for newspaper. But when we are chasing against time and there are new information to be disseminated because it is a social uh, problem and if we need to fight the social problem, we need to create an awareness. So there have been problems regarding wrong information, fake news being disseminated. The matter has gone to the apex court and there are various high courts also. And the apex court government of India also said that uh, Something needs to be done. And the court said that, yes, the journalists are required to uh, quote the official source. And the governments were asked to disseminate news, facts, statistics on a day-to-day -day basis. Definitely, the courts did not interfere on the freedom of media, freedom of press, and what they should report and what they should and did not recommend any pre-fact checking mandatory mechanism, but they only said, yes, you need to quote the government information and at the same time told the government that you should issue such information regularly. So we are here. 
I think the budding scribes, the present students who will become the journalists and the present journalists and the media educators, because they are going to train the budding scribes, we all are required to know. I might have spent a few decades in journalism, but I need to train myself. I need to be equipped how to check with certain tools and how to check with my experience that it does not seem to be uh, correct. So first content wise and then tool wise, I need to update my skill so that no false information as fake news is being disseminated by me. So responsibility of journalism is always discussed and responsibility has gone twofold now because these uh, kinds of tricks and uh, other things to be followed very strictly while dealing with information regarding the pandemic. I'm very happy that UNICEF West Bengal office and the uh, communication specialist of media advocacy, Ms. Shucharita Bordon, who herself is a development communication expert and committed to development communication, has started this 13-part webinar and we are getting our experts from India and other parts of the world and who will actually deal with it. And we have a lot of journalists and media educators and media students present here who require this uh, upgradation of skill. And I'm thankful to Dr. Pandey and again, Professor Chatterjee and Professor Bhattacharya for sparing your time. And I think this repository will remain in the uh, social media so that anybody can fall back. Professor Pandey will tell you that we are sharing two very important handy uh, material. One has been by the uh, IIMC, which has IMC Dhenkanal, their 13th uh, monograph, which is on uh, COVID in the time of, I'm sorry, media in the time of Corona, which has dealt with several aspects of media, which is a very ready recorder kind of a thing. And other is uh, one UN body has come out with certain things on fake news. So these are the new areas, the practicing and the budding and the media scholar, scholars and uh, media educators required to know. And I'm happy that this platform is created and I'm happy that experts are here. So with this, I hand it over back to Dr. Pandey for continuing the same. Welcome one and all. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, uh, address. Uh, uh, we are delighted to introduce Ms. Shucharita Bardhan, uh, the uh, communication specialist, uh, uh, UNICEF Office for West Bengal. She is the person who has uh, conceived of this program and has ensured the implementation in, in this particular format. So we are extremely uh, happy to have her amongst us uh, to introduce the topic. As uh, uh, our President Press Club just uh, said, there are these two files which are available uh, on the right side of, of uh, just above, below your chat box. So you can download those two files. One is a, a document uh, by UNESCO from 2018 on fact checking and the other is uh, on uh, this monograph uh, published by the Indian Institute of Mass Communication, Deng Kanal. It's uh, uh, called Media in Times of uh, COVID-19. So uh, these are available and as uh, you know, we've been sharing uh, other material as well and we've already prepared uh, one on uh, risk journalism and one on uh, storytelling. We'll soon come out with others on media literacy and others as well. So uh, now I invite uh, Ms. Shuchirita Bardhan for her uh, address. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. Uh, I, it will not be much of an address, except that I wanted to draw a context within which we brought this 13-part webinar series. And uh, also specifically um, this topic on infodemic fact-checking challenges of social media. I cannot but acknowledge one of our fellow uh, travelers and champions um, who has been with us as a guide and mentor, uh, Professor Dr. Minal Chatterjee, um, who is definitely that we know, all, all of us know, is the regional uh, director of Indian Institute of Mass Communication, Dhen Kanal. But beyond that, he has been a mentor to many people, both practicing media professionals, media educators, and development um, sector colleagues. And I know many of my colleagues also who have had the privilege of working with him and learning from him. In our stint uh, with the Rajasthan University, uh, we have had extensive learnings and discussions and transactions, if I can say, of uh, uh, understanding how to uh, contextualize development journalism and within that, try to look at evidence-based journalism. And uh, while we were thrown into this entire epidemic, 
we realized very soon that um, infodemic, uh, like the pandemic, as uh, Mr. Snyashi Shur already, already mentioned, is that much more of a challenge. And here I want to draw um, some inputs from practicing media professionals in the district and sub-district, not just people who have access to information um, at the click of a mouse or, or a laptop, but uh, um, that uh, stringer and that sub-district uh, reporter who's expected to bring us information and who's having to go with the tide of learning and unlearning new concepts because they have been evolving and therefore changing. I uh, reflected on one of the uh, very senior most um, media professionals who, who was here the other day and uh, actually um, lent a kind of a, uh, if I can say, a context within which he said that it is good that the information was changing because it was evolving and that information was coming to the forefront. But on the other hand, you we also need to understand how much more difficult it became for uh, somebody who is reporting and is expected to provide information to the media house, to uh, other sources, to be able to keep uh, it at par with the information that is evolving. And what's more challenging when there is misinformation and disinformation all around. I would also like to request both the panelists, and I'm very, very privileged also to have with us uh, Dr. Moshumi Atacharya, whom I've known very closely, who have, we've not worked closely together uh, through our University of Rajasthan partnership, but who has been supporting uh, from outside to some of the planners and I know about that and I sincerely acknowledge that she could be she could participate here and we would like to learn from her as well. I would like to request both the eminent um, speakers to also throw light on what is infodemics. I gather from the previous uh, discussions that a lot of people are commoners like me who are joining this discussion to understand a little more and they, are, they don't have backgrounds as media educators or media professionals. But they're immensely grateful this kind of a discussion and discourse can actually happen. And to them also, it would be good if we could kind of also explain what is infodemics, maybe also explain what is misinformation and disinformation. So that when we're having this very important session, which was uh, needed, it, it is the need of the hour, we can all be on one page and understand what exactly are the perils of not having the facts and the information correct. I will not go into much more details, but to again warmly welcome both the both the panelists. They're very close to our um, long-term uh, walk and journey on development journalism, and I hope that in the coming days also we shall be able to take the journey forward together. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Bardhan, for for your comments. Uh... I must also thank uh, the, the participants uh, who have been uh, regularly join, joining us uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, uh, Dr. Bidu Bhushan Das from KIT University, Dr. Uh, Monika Varma, then uh, all our um, colleagues from Shurindranath College for Women, Dr. Yogendra Kumaran, so many other people and students and journalists and everybody. Thank you so much for your participation. This has extremely been uh, very encouraging. Now, without wasting uh, further time, I would uh, like to formally introduce uh, our first speaker of the day, uh, uh, Dr. Mongshumi Bhattacharya. She is an associate professor in, in, in uh, journalism and mass communication at Bishwa Bharati, a central university of national importance in, in Shantiniketan, India. She has been teaching and, and researching for the last two decades, and her master's and PhD are from the University of Calcutta. Uh, she was attached with the Center for Culture, Media, and Governance, Jamil Islamia, as an ICSSR postdoctoral fellow from 2017 to 2019. She was also selected as a scholar by the U.S. government from India for the coveted uh, uh, SUSI program in journalism in 2016. She also received a prestigious postdoctoral research grant by the International Association of Women and Radio and Television Focus uh, Norway in 2015. Uh, she was take, uh, selected to take part as an expert in the National Mission on Education through ICT by the MHRD Government of India to coordinate the Gender, Media and Society section of the Media and Communication Studies of the uh, EPG uh, Parshala course. Her specializations include new media, audience research, gender studies, convergent journalism and mobile communication, uh, for which she was nominated from India in the uh, Scientific Committee of the Symposium on Asia-USA Part Partnership, organized by the Kennesaw State University, USA Atlanta in 2013. 
Uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. She has also edited the uh, Global Media Journal as the guest editor of uh, the summer 2014 issue and has been on the elected member, uh, has been an elected member of the uh, Indian Board of IAWRT from 2015 to 2020. Uh, now the stage is all yours, Dr. Bhattacharya. Good morning and thank you, Dr. Pandey, for a generous introduction. And I'm very, I'm feeling very blessed actually to be here in this panel with uh, two of my uh, teachers rather, like uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Sneha Shishur, obviously my direct teacher, and I learned a lot from Dr. Vinal Chatterjee, uh, always. And uh, as uh, Ms. Uh, Shucharita Bardhan said, I know that how much work he is doing in this field. So actually, you know, I'm just feeling, I was just feeling what to say because but in front of him, because I know that he's a person in India who is working on this field since uh, beginning. And he actually showed us the path that how to, you know, chronicle all such things together. Anyway, uh, without best, and of course, this initiative, I should congratulate the Press Club of Kolkata, UNICEF, Kolkata office, and obviously, uh, no, uh, thanking to all of you for giving me opportunity. But uh, yes, without wasting any time and with your permission, Minalda, I have learned a lot from you. I have taken many things in my deliberation from your several lectures also. So yeah. So the thing is, as uh, Mr. Sneashi Shud was uh, saying, that it's uh, actually trying time for the journalist and obviously the media professionals so let me also share my own concern that as a media as a media academician, so it's a absolutely a different time for all of us. The way we are teaching is uh, it's starting from teaching online, taking exams online, then uh, you know checking everything online. At the same time, you know you know tackling with uh, information, then uh, everything, and then this infodemic. So obviously we are also learning and we are trying to get hold of this entire situation. So that because in our classes, even at online, we get a lot of questions from students. And like we are also learning, they're also learning together. So something is happening, though it's, a, it's not a new term, but this pandemic has given a different shape to this. So post reporting of the first cases of coronavirus infections from China, and it spread around the world. This uh, social media platforms went abuzz with uh, different theories and perspectives about the virus and its probable place of origin. You all know that. So while I, I mean, I'm just uh, trying to begin my deliberation from that part. So while a section of circulated information reflected uh, reality, a significant quantum deviated from facts and was based on hearsay. As the pandemic gathered momentum and inflicted one nation after another, scale of rumor mongering and conspiracy theories escalated with undesirable consequences, which we all are uh, watching. Dupac said to all, they are doing very good work on pandemic. So they said they consider this to be a part of the infodemic environment, which engulfed the social media space and became immensely prominent during the course of the entire COVID-19 pandemic. So we have seen few observations during the H1N1 pandemic, if we can remember. It drew a parallel between virology and virality in reference to health crisis and social media behavior. So we have seen that. So rate of spread of virus in case of H1N1 and coronavirus matched the rate of information and infodemic dissemination via social media. So researchers uh, have percolated rapidly with one leading to mass ill health and the other mass hysteria. So we have seen that, uh, that, that panic felt by social media dispersing faster than the disease itself. So in due course, racism seeped into the narrative and a certain nation was identified and propagated to be the epicenter. So widely existing anger and lack of trust towards, I know uh, this certain race, products, politics, and leaders became prominent as the pandemic bore on. So the essential behavioral tendency behind such incidents is vulnerability to any form of news without having any inclinations 
towards discerning the validity of such data. For instance, globally circulating misinformation during the pandemic were injecting a disinfectant as was commented by the former US President Donald Trump or eating sea lettuce could protect one from contacting COVID-19 infection. And another misinformation that spread rapidly all over social media, and we saw a lot of memes also on that, that Russian President Vladimir Putin had released 500 lions in the capital city of Moscow to compel the citizens to stay indoors as a part of the government's endeavors to fight the pandemic. So the social effect of such unverified information have been such that this little wave has been treated on an equal platform by the World Health Organization as the other dangerous impact brought by the disease. So in his statement delivered on 15th February 2020, the Munich uh, security at the Munich Security Conference, Dr. Uh, Adenen, the Director General of WHO, mentioned this ramification of the pandemic, which uh, Mr. Sneha Shur also mentioned. He astutely noted that one of the most significant parallel battles rendered by I mean, rendered by the COVID-19 has been battled against disinformation and misinformation. He acknowledged that the human society is not just fighting the pandemic, but also fighting the infodemic that has been running loose ground the pandemic. Indeed, as the pandemic produced this, its lingering effects across the world, false information regarding it too has spread around like wildfire. So the objective behind the proliferation of such is at its essence the same as the motive behind the spreading of any other forms of false information. And the central idea is to increase social media user engagement. Uh, in a world where uh, sources for acquiring of similar information are numerous, the common objective of all mass media channels is to attract and engage as much readers as possible. So to attain this, they sometimes choose to ignore checking the fundamental parameter of verifiability. Moreover, they uh, do not feel the need to comprehend the degree of ramifications that their published news articles might generate. So my discussion emphasizes on diverse reports and article publications that have been circulated in the social media, producing such misinformation and having generated significant social repercussions, based on which it observes this infodemic dimension and its ramifications at higher level, like uh, national social dynamics and uh, individual security concern. So uh, I'm trying to essentially highlight the process in which misinformation is circulated by uh, diverse social media platforms. So and, and the different social, national and international impacts they render and the basic measure the society can adapt to make itself less vulnerable to this process. And as we all know, with the rise, I mean, I'm talking about a little bit about social media, then I'll be getting into the infodemic as Ms. Uh, Suchuita Borden uh, suggested. So with the rise of the Internet, companies identified new streams based on which they could reach their target user cohorts. We all know this. The more frequent the usage of the internet became, the more number of companies integrated into the system. This was followed by the emergence of new media groups and also individuals who themselves became brands to be followed based on the information they presented. Like social activist blogger Emin L. Navzar and a health and fitness blogger Sia Cooper. News media houses interpreted the internet as a platform having the highest potentiality for reaching their consumers and holding on to these groups. The first benefit the medium produced was with relevance to the domain of economy. Media outlets could derive higher margins of profits by publishing their news through online channels via the internet, since it was much cheaper compared to the traditional physical newspaper. We all know this. And the result of this is what the newspaper domain is struggling. So, so the, this is the situation. So I will, I will like to 
uh, give the uh, example of Warren Buffett, the, the prominent businessman also, who have sold their stakes in newspapers, like in in uh, and and uh, out of bankruptcy. But the impact has been sharper. I, I mean, during the pandemic, it happened during the pandemic. A major section of the newspaper publishing houses rely on local advertisements as their primary sources of revenues. So these include restaurants, bars, banks, car dealerships, movie theaters, realtors, community events like concerts and other stage performance. So the wide stretches of lockdown period rendered all such occurrences to cease in absolute terms. This hit the financial dimension of the global newspaper domain at its heart. So this is important to understand. So in India, the newspaper industry was formerly a vibrant functional realm that reached millions of readers every day. The lockdown caused by the pandemic rendered drastically declined revenue shares, which translated into rapid slashing of employment and salaries, apart from the closure of the local aspect of the revenue generation sources. So major business houses too slashed their advertisement expenditure limits during this period. Consequently, prominent brands like the Times of India, which has consistently been one of the largest circulating English journalists across the world, had its supplements reduced from 40 pages to 16 pages. So we can understand the growth of the social media domain in this regard, how it is. That's why I told about this. So a prominent manner in which media houses ensure that they connect with their market frequently is through the application of push notification also. This is also very important. So push notification is a message containing the headline of an article publication that pops up in the screen of the mobile phone of the user. The message is delivered through an app that is software installed in the mobile phone. However, the user does not need to log in or enter the relevant app in order to view the push notification. So instead, the user will be directed to the app once they become interested in the push notifications message and click on to it have to have complete access into the publication. So we can understand what actually the many other things, technology, starting from technology to devices and all everything, how they are actually getting into the social media business. So according to ZT, the IBM owned company that enables such push notification for companies, open rates of push notifications range from 30% to 60%, while interaction rate is as much as 40%. So in comparison, average open rate of all this social media, it's every day, it was uh, every month, it was increasing by 5%. So it's, it's, it's from the researcher's perspective, I'm saying. So all these developments have rendered the social media to become an integral part of our daily life. And currently 4.57 billion people across the globe using internet of which 346 million users have been newly introduced to the internet domain within the last 12 months. Such mammoth level of stimulation has been possible due to the increased affordability of people also we, we need to understand regarding the usage of mobile phone. Currently, there are 5.15 billion unique mobile phone users across the globe. So adding to this is the decreased cost of availing mobile internet services, which has thus increased its affordability. So with this background, now uh, I have to, uh, at least as uh, Ms. Shuchurita Bhardhan said, that I need to um, uh, clarify a bit what is infodemic. So this is a scenario social media users. It's you know, going lips and bounds. And, and now, now what is infodemic? If I go by the, uh, you know, the copybook uh, definition of infodemic, an infodemic can be defined as the excessive amount of circulated information with uh, relevance to a problem such that rendering its solution becomes a more difficult scenario. So this occurs because the information being spread is essentially unreliable and unverifiable, but it has the capability to make the recipient of the information more anxious as they find it difficult to segregate the information that is backed by real evidence from the information that is unreliable but broad ranged. And uh, from this copybook definition, it can be discerned that the fundamental factors driving infodemic 
a lack of definability and degree of relevance. The information constituted by an infodemic does not have the credibility to withstand the screening process of verification. However, they are highly relevant to the society as they are concerned with use issues that are affecting the people at a particular point of time. Another factor which characterizes infodemic and also renders the phenomenon to be a highly alarming factor in the modern society is a level of exaggeration of the news. The subject of the information is pertinent to the social concerns, but the content is often exaggerated. However, so in most of the cases, the degree of far fetching is not such that the content will altogether appear outlandish to the general public. Therefore, the significance of infodemic resides in the fact that the information is unverifiable and exaggerated, but convincing and relevant to the common reader. So the information thus spread by the infodemic is a form of misinformation or disinformation. It is a misinformation when the false information is being circulated without having an overlying objective to spread a rumor or propaganda. Why? It is a disinformation when the incorrect publication has been rendered in order to strategically direct, produce and proliferate propaganda. So the final issue concerning the production and the circulation of such information is that their point of origin is often untraceable, as will be comprehended through the examples provided in the, I mean, I mean I'll be trying to uh, give examples, few international and national. So while the information creates a major impact, it is often unknown from where they are originating from. This renders infodemic to be an even more lethal phenomenon. So coming, uh, if, if I uh, look into the international effect of social media infodemic, so we'll see that the social media has been the foundation, foundational pillar for uh, the rapid circulation of infodemic can be discerned by the significance of popular social media platform like Facebook and WhatsApp in spreading false news. And the front runner here is Facebook. A new research published by Nature Human Behavior suggests that Facebook spreads fake information more rapidly than any other social media platform. So and it has been observed that Facebook acts as the referral site directing to untrustworthy news sources at a rate of more than 50% of the time. In comparison, it directs users to untrustworthy sources only 6% of the time. Such research has noted that the small difference that each fake publication brings in the minds of the readers play crucial role in gradually manipulating their framework of thoughts. It implies that infodemic attract readers more than genuine articles, rendered by the fact that people on average spend 64 seconds over fake articles while spending only 42 seconds reading verified news stories. I would request all the uh, students out here, mass communication, to go through such research reports. I can send the, my references to Dr. Pandey also, if you want it. So this provides evidence of the attraction caused by false information. Recurrent disinformation articles are directed to play significant roles in gradually building up the psychology of people towards a higher purpose. Such higher objectives can be political, as in the case of the US presidential election we have observed. An article authored by Gunther et al. suggests that uh, in 2016, American presidential election might have been substantially manipulated and driven by fake news. It's a, a common, I mean, I think well-known factor. So examples of fa fake news that became popular during the 2016 presidential election of America are that Hillary Clinton was suffering from a serious illness and that Pope Francis was endorsing Donald Trump. So another fake publication that had serious repercussions within the voters was that Hillary Clinton had approved the selling of weapons to Islamist jihadists, which included the ISIS. Such disinformation were believed to be at least probably true by even voters 
who previously endorsed Obama and so could be taken as supporters of the Democratic Party. So the same research shared that Obama voters was 20 percent. Their devi deviation in subsequent endorsement of Donald Trump for the 2016 election proved to be one of the key factors that decided the outcome. So another prominent mass media platform, Twitter, also played a role in the proliferation of such information. Numerous fake user accounts were created that actively circulated such articles. The weakness of the system can be discerned from the fact that even a couple of years later, policymakers failed to suspend or block four out of five these accounts. So publications of fake news from unclear sources have led to serious social disturbances in other part of the world as well. I'll, I would like to give one more example. In Italy, it was reported that a nine year old Muslim girl was sexually assaulted by a 35 year old man who was apparently, apparently her husband. So the report whose origin was unknown was circulated with the objective of producing anti-immigrant sentiment. So it resulted in widespread social media condemnation of Islam. In France, a rumor had suddenly, I mean, another example, suddenly emerged in the social media that some people from the minority group of Roma community were driving a van trying to kidnap children. So some men from the community were snatching children from the poorer areas of Paris for organ trafficking. So all these things actually created humorous records. The police prefecture of the uh, Paris subsequently presented their observation that the information regarding child kidnapping was completely false. But by that time, you know, the damage has been done. So the replication of infodemic were even more acute during the COVID crisis around the globe. During the initial months of the pandemic, false information spread like widely that drinking cleaning products that were based on alcohol, like methanol, would cure one from the disease. This led to the death of more than 800 people around the world, while around 6,000 had to be hospitalized. Yet another example of information that was unverified but became very popular about consumption of the hydroxychloroquine drug could work as a cure to COVID-19, even though the information lacked authenticity. It became widely believed which rendered disastrous consequences. Overdoses of the drug resulted in hospitalization and deaths in many parts of the world like Nigeria and Vietnam. Now I will be coming to the Indian picture quickly. So in India, the concern of false information is not a new phenomenon. Compared to most other nations, India is at a more vulnerable position regarding the susceptibility to false information because while the country's internet user base is growing at a substantial pace, laws pertinent to online information governance are not robust enough. Consequently, the repercussions to infodemic are acute and often deadly. An instance of such occurred in Tamil Nadu which resulted in the death of one person and gave injuries to many others. A rumor was widely circulating that a group of, again, the child snatcher, like France, were functioning around the region. So videos were forwarded in WhatsApp showing the perpetrators in action as they rode in motorbikes and picked up children. During that period, a family of five was traveling by car towards a temple in the region. So they asked for direction the way we do normally. So during which an elderly woman uh, became suspicious of the family and raised alarm. The family was then stopped in the next village. They were brought out of their car, stripped, beaten and left for death. A woman died while her son-in-law entered into coma. The abduction videos were later traced to be social awareness videos in uh, other countries, passed forward. I mean, it was actually happened in some other country. And that was shown as real video. So the villages could get together and organize themselves against the family quickly due to WhatsApp messages. So infodemic affected the country strikingly during the initial period of the, period of the COVID crisis. As soon as the first case was reported in India on January 30, there was a massive spike in reporting with pertinence to the in pandemic within the nation's social media domain. Among the many fake videos and articles regarding the crisis that were widely circulated during that time 
one of the most popular was the mis misinformation that home in that home the vitamin c remedies could prevent one from getting the disease fake videos were even published featuring the dr debbie shetty a well known medical practitioner in which he was recommending that lemon juice in hot water could be a possible immunity booster against covid-19 another common misinformation spread during this period was based on fake messages delivered uh, by a few uh, like uh, communal group so the appealing videos uh, showcase the miraculous capabilities of a few things which we generally do not use or do not eat and for curing the disease so prompted by such video many town many cities many villages had started organizing you know large scale of gathering such stuff for drinking so consequently icmr the top medical research body of the country had to repeatedly issue appeals to the people to stop following such false information and another round of fake video and publications were circulated in the first few weeks post the imposition of the initial lockdown period so and and the news indicated that the lockdown imposed was actually a means for the army to take over the governmental framework of the country so it 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 prompted the additional director general of public information adgpi of the indian army to issue a clarification that denied such rumors and false information now a quick look to the measures for resisting such influence of infodemic so with the alarming rise of such cases measures have been adopted by national governments as well as by social media outlets to resist the proliferation of false information Facebook has presently employed fact checking team on large scale in all nation the teams have been assigned to put warning labels on articles and posts containing unverifiable information and have the authority to even take such content down from the platform without any notice while such actions do result in erasing the content deemed to have potential disturbing consequences a problem arises in the fact that such measures take you know three or four texts of uh, you know actualize so by that time i mean at least few hours so by that time substantial real life repercussions have already taken place to address this issue the company has integrated circuit breaker algorithms which stop to promote a viral post in order to verify its content however that too is in an initial stage of application whatsapp has also taken some measures as well as to limit the circulation to questionable content it attaches a forwarded tag as you all know we, as we all forward whatsapp messages i i i guess all of you are aware of it by now that it attaches a forwarded tag to posts that are passed on from one user to the next so while also restricting the mass circulation of viral messages but this does not ensure the absolute prevention of infodemic circulation twitter too has introduced major initiatives that endeavor towards marketing information that are unverifiable and potential threats to the society so it has started applying warning messages on such tweets that present misleading information the three new categories on which twitter will evaluate questionable tweets are misleading information uh then disputed claims and unverified claims so misleading information category will constitute of tweets that have erroneous or misleading information given by individuals or groups which are actually uh, experts on that specific subject matter so disputed claims are those tweets that contain assertions or statements whose authenticity are questionable and contested finally unverified claims are such tweets whose claims and information are unverified at the time of the publication of the tweet while the screening process is thus more nuanced and layered than that of facebook or whatsapp questions arise whether the moderators will be overwhelmed by the amount of information presented for evaluation this is because like all other social media platform twitter as well is flooded with information which thus renders it difficult to <coughs> sorry to keep tab on all of its constantly inflating data so while the social media platforms are adopting different ways to tackling infodemic concern nations too are becoming more interested in taking proper measures so that 
further social disturbance from such sources can be resisted. I, I'll give you one or two examples here. Like in the United States, actions are being taken both at national and state level. California state government passed a law that instructed pub public schools to make media literacy as a major subject, which is a very important thing. In fact, in India also, we are trying to incorporate media literacy. I mean, from uh, obviously from uh, since, since few years, and it is absolutely important these days. So the law has been inspired by the observations of a Stanford University student who comprehended that most people fail to differentiate between authentic news stories and sponsored content. Other states like Washington and Massachusetts are passing bills that emphasize on media literacy. In Canada also, a digital charter that promised action against fake news and hold social media tech companies accountable if misinformation and disinformation created unrest in the society. However, the charter does not make it clear what are the parameters that render information to be deemed fake while also keeping it unclear how the process of applying fines would actually operate. In India, internet shutdowns are frequent for resisting the effects of infodemic. That's what we have seen. Shutdowns range from absolute turning of the internet to a partial shutdown requiring considerable slowing down of the internet speed. In, 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 in this month, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology released alterations to the 2000 IT Act draft requiring social media platforms to trace the source point of fake information when the government asks for such. So I, I would ask the participant, request the participant to go through this news. It's an absolute, last week we got this. So the central and the state governments have also invoked section 54 provisions of the Disaster Management Act 2005 to curb the menace. So individual states also apply sedation charges while some like West Bengal have introduced their own regulations um, against fake news. So individually, as all people can resist, susceptibility to such false information in the social media by applying a number of easy measures while reading the content of a page people can investigate reliability of the source by checking the name of the author and finding out where there is any additional information provided about them additionally they can also investigate the nature of the website by finding out its mission and contact information Moreover, any major development or event will be bound to be reported by more than one news media outlets. Readers can thus verify the content easily by finding similar information in other websites through Google searches. Another viable <coughs> option is to consult fact checking sites whenever one is in doubt. So diverse libraries across the globe have established platforms to help readers identify the credibility of a news source. One such major podium is CRAAP, Currency, Relevance, Authority, Accuracy and Purpose, established by the Medium Library and California State University. So finally, another quick and easy solution is to check the date of the publication content uh, that is targeted as an infodemic in most occasions does not present any publishing date. Please, uh, please um, uh, like remember this. So it's a very common phenomenon. It is either false information or old information being passed on as new. Now to conclude the discussion that false information of diverse forms have far reaching ramifications. The essential reason for such is the increased accessibility of people to the world of the social media. So with the decline of physical newspaper subscriptions, which I tried to mention in the beginning of my deliberation, and increased penetration of mobile smartphone, the capability of people to access the internet has increased by multiple folds. Due to this, more shares of people are getting introduced to the social media domain every year. So in a comparison to the frequency with which people are entering this realm, the regulations that govern the world of the social media and the internet are yet to have robust establishments. Social media networks are essentially still in the developing stage and so are grappling with the large amount of information they are supposed to investigate. So regulations at national levels 
as well uh, are yet to con uh, concretize in such a term that can address all the uh, possible dimension of the issue. So the result of this is that there is still ample room for perpetrators to initiate and execute their infodemic action. So the objective can be to achieve higher social or political goal or simply to misdirect the general public. The replications of such acts can be felt at both societal level as well as in terms of the security of the individual self. So once the information goes into the hands of the general public, it becomes uncertain how the letter is going to react. So the outcome can be disastrous as have been noted in, in, in many cases. So uh, the, however, while the nations and social media platforms are still struggling to resist the acts of infodemic, individual readers have ample tactics based on which they can gauge the authenticity of a publication. So approaches range from inspecting the web website individually to utilizing the fact checking platforms for verification. So people simply need to be inclined to do so, thus resisting themselves from reacting immediately to such false information. For this, they have to rise above their own biases and form evaluations with even mindsets. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bhattacharya, for your extremely relevant deliberations. And uh, uh, we are extremely thankful to you for, for uh, participating in today's discussion and sharing your views here. Uh, I'm extremely delighted to report that we've had over 100 uh, participants at, at today's program and uh, scholars and uh, students and uh, colleagues and uh, even our uh, former classmates have joined the today's uh, uh, deliberation. So, and there are quite a few questions on the chat box as well. We'll take them at the end of the deliberation after uh, the next uh, speaker gets over. So uh, I'll again want to thank Dr. Monica Verma, Mr. Pushpak Bhattacharya, Shravani Paul, Shupriyo Mishra, Devasrita Chakraborty, uh, Rithik Bhaduri, uh, uh, and Shubhajit Acharya, uh, Subhashri Jana, Momita De Das, Jagroop Singh, Dr. Manisha Tomar for your uh, participation today. Of course, uh, uh, Ms. Nirupama Ghosh, she's been there all, uh, every day. Vinit Kumar, Pinky Deswal, thank you everyone for your deliberations. We'll uh, try and ensure that we take uh, most of it. And uh, as we informed right at the beginning, uh, that these two very important documents are there available on the chat box. So you can download them or we'll even uh, make sure that, you know, it's mailed to you. Uh, now I have the, uh, is uh, Professor Chatterjee online? Uh, yeah, I am. Your video is uh, uh, not working, sir. No, video is on. I can see. We can see him. Oh, you can yeah. see him? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 For some reason. Okay. Okay. So I'm sorry. I mean, uh, for some reason, it's not uh, uh, visible from, from my uh, screen. Uh, so I have the... Uh, very, very pleasant privilege of introducing uh, uh, Professor Dr. Minal Chatterjee. Uh, I'm personally indebted to him for a number of reasons, and uh, he has been with us uh, at, at the UNICEF uh, Rajasthan uh, for, for very long, and uh, we have uh, quite a few uh, things to take away from there. But uh, formally, uh, Dr., uh, Professor Dr. Chatterjee is the uh, Regional Director and Professor at the Indian Institute of Mass Communication, uh, Dhenkana. Before joining IMC, he was the editor in charge of the North Orissa edition of uh, Odia Daily uh, Shangbat. And he's a very, very accomplished journalist as well, having worked on uh, different media apart from uh, Shangbat. And he's uh, published uh, six books on mass communication. I'm privileged to have edited one book with him on uh, media, uh, 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 democracy and development. Uh, he has uh, uh, eight anthologies of short stories, and many of them have been translated into Indian and foreign languages. He's also a very accomplished uh, TEDx speaker. He recently had a TED talk uh, uh, in IAM Sambalpur and uh, also associated with the International Association for Media and Communication Research. Uh, we are delighted to have you here, sir. Uh, thank you so much for, for accepting our uh, invitation. Thank you. Let me begin with uh, kind of an announcement that uh, all of you know that uh, flights to Britain has been suspended because of the new strain of uh, coronavirus. So as the flights have been suspended, so uh, my uh, visit to England 
on uh, New Year's Eve also has been cancelled. So during this uh, New Year, I'll be in my home at uh, Tinkerbell. Why this announcement and how many of you really have believed in this? I'm sure after the, the grand introduction of uh, Dr. Pandey, he is this, he is that. Many of you might believe, yes, yes, what Jaitai Pari. I mean, what's the big deal of going to England to spend uh, New Year? Right? Let me tell you, this is false. Right? Fake news spreads. And the more it spreads, the more people tend to believe it. There are several reasons why we tend to believe fake news. I'll come to that. The difference between fake news and false news is in fake news, there are elements of truth. In the announcement, I began with a piece of truth. Flights have actually been suspended because the new strain of coronavirus has been traced in Britain. Right now, the second part is false. I have no plans nor means to go to England to spend uh, New Year. Right, but I took this opportunity to put in this so that people might believe in it and they might think that oh my god, Bernal Chatterjee is such a big man that he goes every year to England to spend his uh, New Year Eve. Right? So I have my agenda. I wanted to promote myself as a very accomplished globe trotter. I took this opportunity of the flights to England being suspended right now and put in this as a hyphen, hyphenated information. And thereby, I increased the believability of this information, right? I did, I did it deliberately. So this is how fake news is created and disseminated, spread. There is an agenda and to, 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 to work on that agenda, some truth is deliberately dug out and some falsehood is doped into it. Recently, I saw a video of uh, Mukesh Ambani, Nita Ambani, and there is a grand function going on in their house. And the questions, angry questions, why this kind of functions going on in Mukesh Ambani's house when there is a pandemic. Now, fact, quick fact check told me that this is not a new video. It was a video of some three, four, five years ago. Right? So, some element of truth plus some element of calculated falsehood. That makes fake news. Now, let me tell you about the types of fake news. There could be propaganda. There could be misleading content, there could be imposter content. Imposter content is when genuine sources are impersonated with false made up sources. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was a, uh, there was a video, there's a picture actually, of uh, uh, Biru and Jai, our Amitabh Bachchan and uh, Dharmendra from Sole, right? That shot. And the news that, that was written that uh, these people were shot by Israeli forces. Whoever has put it, and, and it was purported to come from Al Jazeera. Now, Al Jazeera came up with an explanation that this is a fake news. Look at the, at the, our, our, our logo there, it's not exactly our logo. So this is 
what we call imposter content. There could be false context, like the example that I gave you to begin with. This false connection, manipulative content, rumors, and clickbait. These are different types of fake news. Clickbait, all of us know. The headline will be telling us something very, very sensational. But actually, when you go and read the news, there will be nothing. Clickbait. This is to attract uh, people to that site. Now, the question that I asked, why do people tend to believe in fake news? And let me tell you another thing, that the fake news is not a recent phenomenon. In our Mahavarta also, we have example of fake news. Mahavarta, in, in, in Mahavarati war, right? Ashwatthama Hata Iti Gaja, Drona, was killed as a result of spread of a false news by Sri Krishna. Ashwatthama Hata Iti Gaja. So in, in recorded history, we find that uh, some people say that ancient Greek writer Herodotus as the founder of selective sourcing. Others claim that fake news began in 15th century Italy uh, to justify mass arrest, torture, execution of members of Italian Jewish community. Orson Welles' 1938 radio adaptation of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds was first aired as a news bulletin. So fake news has always been there. Right? And it has been deliberately used by high and mighty for their own political and other purposes. It has been there. What has happened due to the, the spread of internet is that spreading fake news, altering context, making it more real like you can talk to a video fake video has also come so it has become easier so look at the internet users in india 73 million users are there internet users right so when there are so many users and a, a sizable section of the users are uh, not very, uh, how should I put it, familiar with, with how these technologies work, then we are susceptible to fake news. Now, let me tell you that uh, how, how, why we tend to believe fake news. Now, the recent historical work in psychology shows that more exposure to fake news make it spread. The more we are exposed to fake news, the more we tend to believe. This is called illusory truth effect. Illusory truth effect. The more you expose yourself to fake news, right, the more you will tend to believe. That is what the, the researchers in psychology, they have found out. Another explanation is given by anthropologists. They explain it this way, that in believing fake news, right, we have a stake. Let me give you an example. Here is my friend who read in a WhatsApp message that uh, coronavirus, they die if they are exposed to heat. And if you stand under the sun, probably the coronavirus in your body will die. So you'll be safe, right? So he, he stood there on, under the sun for three years and burnt himself, right? Now, now look why he did this. He did this because he thought that I'm not losing anything except the color of my skin 
probably a shade darker by standing under the sun. If I do not do that, probably I might get affected, impacted, and probably I might die. So it's between death in his mind. It's between death and standing under the sun for half an hour, one hour. So it's easy and it's perfectly natural for a person to opt for the letter. You get my point. And that is how people tend to believe in fake news. And as Dr. Bhattacharya explains very beautifully, read the consequences. This is how. Now, what is being done to contain fake news? I'm very happy uh, Moshmi gave you all the details what is being done at the, the platform level, the major tech giants platform level, what Twitter is doing, what Facebook is doing, what Google is doing. They are tweaking with their algorithms. They are also uh, having fact-checking teams in different countries to physically, manually check. They are doing that. Uh, laws are being promulgated. I have a difference of opinion when it comes to law. We have enough laws and we do not need any more laws to curb right, fake news, quote unquote. It might so happen that we may throw the baby with the bathwater if there are more laws, right? So we need to, to, to think more deeply into that aspect, the coercive aspect of limiting fake news. I'll rather go the other way. The best way to contain fake news, and let me tell you, it will be impossible to eliminate fake news. And it is not desirable also. It's not desirable also to completely eliminate, right? There has to be some element of fun. There has to be some element of hide and seek with, uh, with fact. Probably there also is a connect with democracy, with free thinking, right? So complete elimination is not done. And it's very difficult to do, say, for example, the announcement with which I started. It will become, it will be impossible for any algorithm to find out whether this is true or false, right? So what we need to do is to spread media literacy. Fake news can be contained more by common sense and awareness that such a thing exists and this spreads like this, right? This awareness is the best antidote against fake news, media literacy. I'm happy that uh, Moshimi also spoke about steps being taken in Canada, in US, in several other countries to introduce media literacy in curricula. I guess in India also, we have a need to put in media literacy in, in, in our curricula from school level. Because look at the user profile of, of social media, especially. Right. So therefore, we need to have media literacy introduced in, in school and college curricula, uh, um, preferably from school level. That's one thing that we can do. We can take steps to make people aware, make people uh, media literate at the community level as well. So community level school level and other levels as well. 
So as many uh, ways as possible, we must put emphasis on spreading media literacy. That is one good antidote to content fake news. I'll end my deliberation to infodemic. And how do we contain the fake news related to infodemic? Very difficult, but it's possible. It's possible. It's possible in three ways. Way one, make people adhere to common sense. B, make people media literate. And three, the, the civil society leaders, the academicians, journalists, media, people who can engage with community, people whom the community look up for guidance, they should come in a big way to contain fake news. If a teacher tells in a village that, look here, this is a fake news, then the villagers might listen to him. Right? That is how probably we should contain fake news. I'm so very happy to, to, to discuss fake news. And this is one important uh, aspect that all of us who are associated with media, who are associated with media education, must work on this aspect. Thank you, UNICEF, for thinking of such a webinar. And thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity to speak a few words. And I am in Dhekanal this year. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for for your for your uh, uh, such an interesting uh, presentation, and it's always a delight to uh, listen to you on on uh, uh, you know these topics. And uh, we are we are also very happy to inform you that there has been a lot of work going uh, from our end as well on uh, many of these issues because uh, uh, we, we've been having a lot of uh, questions on, uh, say, for example, the audience perspective or why do people believe what they do, or how people believe in conspiracy theories, for example. So there are uh, uh, two presentations that we have uh, prepared on that. One is on the cognitive biases, and there's another on uh, storytelling. So we have, uh, 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 you know, shared it with our uh, participants today. And as I told you, we'll be sharing another on media literacy as well in our uh, next webinar. So there are a few questions, and uh, many of those have been al already been answered. But I'll just uh, take uh, some of them, and uh, both Dr. Bhattacharya and uh, uh, Professor Chatterjee can. Uh, uh, take those questions. Uh, there's one question uh, from a uh, uh, colleague at my college, uh, uh, Mr. Shotto Vratopal, uh, who's also a media professional uh, of, of uh, for very long. And he says, you know, there is this uh, uh, tussle between uh, trying to post something very fast because that is how you get good ratings uh, on Google and that is how people would, you know, read that. And then, you know, uh, to, to check it. So how how do how does one you know reconcile that because as you understand uh, that even even as uh, uh, you know content producers we are uh, subject to the same biases a lot of those theories and uh, i don't want to get into all those uh, details of, of cognitive science but our brain abhors you know things which it can't explain so it will always uh, uh, bring out you know some reason to explain when something happens or does not happen so uh, this is a, a very real problem for, for a lot of us. So how do we uh, handle that? Uh, any of you can take that, Professor Chatterjee or Dr. Bhattacharya? Yeah, I, I have been uh, in uh, active journalism for over 15 years. And every day we face this question. My take on this is go by go case by case. If it's a news which, even without verification, can go and it won't make much difference if, if at the later day it turns out to be uh, wrong, go for it. But if you think this will create a problem, if 
if verification is needed and is a must then wait verify publish that's my take on it go case by case uh thank you thank you so much sir there are two questions uh, basically on these uh, uh, cognitive biases one by deboshrita uh, uh, chakraborty and another by opratim bhadacharya uh, so as i said you know we have shared those uh, uh, links there and uh, that would be such a big you know kind of a, a discussion on uh, the cognitive biases that influence us or or the you know a very important one that we know as uh, uh, confirmation bias so uh, would uh, anyone of you want to take it on confirmation bias or shall i go to the next question that we we want to believe uh, uh, certain things and that is why the, much of these fake news uh, even these you know uh, news checks or fact che checkers at times are not so uh, uh, this is uh, effective because people have this kind of a confirmation bias. Pandey, it's plain. I mean, Dr. Pandey, it's plain common sense. If I want to believe that cow's urine can cure me from corona, no amount of ICMR press release is going to convince me otherwise. Right? However, however. it depends on the kind of faith you have on that remedy right on that system right and there is again a question of stake if i don't have to lose a lot a whole lot while doing that i do that right so i guess it's it's there in in every one of us but we act often without reason and that is where there is a problem most we can have is her take no i i do agree with you uh, professor chatterjee like it it depends it's not always that uh, what we uh, want to do it it at times like what actually uh, we are you know understanding and you know there is a very big thing which i guess also that is the peer pressure family pressure and the societal pressure also so and i don't know whether i should use the term pressure so understanding or believing so we uh, in our everyday life we do many things like maybe that is not scientifically correct but i feel that that is that works for me that works for me or that might work for others also so in that way also what professor chatterjee said that i uh, believe in this and the very basic question i guess professor chatterjee will agree to it that is literacy literacy in terms of not in terms of like you know you can write or you can speak it's about you know uh, the way you ignite your mind also so that is also a very big thing so unless and until we get over all such things so these things will go on i guess i mean people act out of two 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 uh, things one is greed lobe yeah and another is bhoy threat right if somebody tells me that if you stand under the sun for half an hour otherwise you are going to get uh, affected by corona i'll better go and stand bhoy right we are scared you get my point so the misinformation the way we find it they are also based on these two basic human traits yeah. greed and threat right so we have to understand that and then we need to work our strategy yes the next question please yeah so uh, th this is the final set of questions because most of the others have been answered so these are uh, uh, plain and simple questions from our students and uh, the question is that is there any law or punishment for fake news spreaders and there's another uh, very similar question that uh, uh, this is by supriyo mishra it says is there any act in the indian constitution that uh, uh, can you know help us stop uh, fake news or things like that so how how can law help us so basically there are two or three questions on that one is by shrabuni paul another by supriyo mishra then there's by pushpak bhattacharya as well i guess uh, dr bhattacharya has answered that in yeah. our deliberation there are yeah. several uh, laws in fact 
Yep. Uh, uh, Moshumi, you can answer. Yeah, actually, I have mentioned it. Yes, uh, Professor Chatterjee. There are a few laws. In fact, uh, as I told you, uh, that uh, the very recent one is uh, the last week. If you go through, in fact, Dr. Pandey, if you want, uh, I can send you those links also, so that you can. Uh, because you know, even if I tell it to them again, so it will be difficult to remember this thing because there are a few things one needs to read, read and needs so to understand. We can, we can, because, we can share yeah. it with all those who have registered. So if you can send us, we'll mail it to all yeah. of them. Absolutely, I'll send it to you because these are the things all media students uh, we need to learn. And the student, those who have asked the question, let me tell you that while uh, thinking about this webinar, so I was also trying to think like what uh, of the uh, as a media teacher what we should do because we are also learning and what a government could do. And in that way, I got uh, many research articles also in this way. So I like I would love to share them with you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists. And uh, again, you know, there are there have been uh, very many related questions. Most of them have already been answered. Uh, there's our colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jayati Kumar uh, from uh, Bardwan University. She wanted uh, uh, us to talk on audience psychology, and it has been dealt with both by uh, uh, Professor Chatterjee and uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. And as I said, we've also shared two uh, YouTube uh, uh, videos uh, on, on cognitive biases and, uh, you know, storytelling, which is also a uh, a lot about uh, these things. Uh, I again want to thank very, very senior uh, colleagues. You know, like uh, we have Professor Basar Prabhu Jirli from Banaras Hindu University, the uh, uh, Institute for Agricultural Sciences, uh, and uh, a very senior colleague of mine. Very uh, nice to see him um, among the audience. Dr. Tanushri Mukherjee, she's been there every day. And uh, as I've already uh, spoken of Dr. Bidu Bhushan Das and uh, so many people, and uh, I can't thank them, Dr. Monika Verma, Vinit Kumar, and so many other people. Thank you very much for your participation. And that has inspired us to, you know, even look for more and offer more. And uh, even behind the scenes, there have been a lot of brainstorming amongst us, you know, uh, as, as organizers. And we have uh, kept on adding to, uh, uh, you know, these things in, in certain ways. So the data journalism uh, thing that started off from uh, UNICEF Rajasthan has now led on to risk journalism and storytelling and so many other things. And I'm sure that, uh, uh, you know, with, with this positive energy that there is uh, so much uh, more to look forward to. Uh, uh, thanks uh, particularly to uh, Mr. Charita Bhardhan, uh, especially uh, because uh, she's taken a very, very keen interest, a very passionate interest in all that. And her academic inputs have, have been really, really uh, uh, very, very uh, 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 exciting. And it has led us to, you know, uh, do more uh, for these kind of things. So as you can understand, our next speaker will be Ms. Ashucharita Bhardhan to, to uh, offer her final comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pandey. I will not be much of a speaker and I will not try to summarize. Um, I think um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bhattacharya for actually uh, tending to my request of uh, trying to define some of the concepts because that clarity is very much required, especially in the public domain where not many can actually attend uh, media schools or classes. And therefore, these kinds of public discourses open up opportunities. Also, uh, the very uh, many uh, examples that she has cited, both globally and in India, uh, probably helped people to identify with similar situations. Uh, and uh, this this concept of tending to believe that I that I picked uh, is, is lurking behind the cognitive sciences that we were talking about. As far as uh, the next, um, um, you know, uh, deliberation was concerned, I'm always very um, attracted to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Dr. Chatterjee's references to um, historical contexts, mythologies, etc. He he has so creatively brought in Mahabharata, and uh, he contextualizes uh, the the basic instincts of humanity. And, and within which he, he tries to relate uh, news and media. And he has been doing that with us even in our discourses in the, in the University of Rajasthan um, uh, interactions that we've had. Uh, I will only want to mention that um, I have one very big takeaway. Uh, as many of us know that only webinars will not serve the purpose for us. As you know, sir, we work for children. And um, we know that children are uh, very important uh, members in a family, which comprises naturally their parents and elders and therefore the neighborhood and community 
And definitely we talk about uh, you know, democratic structure, we talk about governance, and we have all our stakeholders and actors to make for a uh, society and a nation. And uh, this particular topic transcends all and cuts across all of it, and therefore that much more important. I have a particular takeaway which I would like to mention, and I like to verbalize these so that I throw a challenge to myself that when I meet next time, you can question me how far have you been able to progress. So this entire concept of media literacy, uh, way back in my days in Rupkala Kendra, which was, uh, which is, which still is a uh, uh, Institute of Social Communication and Information Cultural Affairs Department of the Government of West Bengal. This is something that we had tried to do, media literacy. But now I think I should be able to bring in some more meaning. We're trying to look at um, integrating media literacy in the school curriculum. And this is also something that we had attempted even in Assam, I remember. And uh, in the times that have come now, this is absolutely essential. Uh, I am also keen to look at um, how to uh, bring in more district and sub-district media professionals into some kind of hands-on orientation. Uh, many times they fall back and media houses have told us, important media houses in our meetings in Delhi have said, we look at agencies like you to come forward and support us in doing that because we're not always able to. And I know that uh, those of us who have smartphones and are very uh, adept to using these technologies uh, often have an advantage while many others don't. And uh, definitely we would like to reach out to and address the inequities even in this case and see how to make information available and accessible to everyone. And with that, the understanding that goes behind it. Very interesting words of um, Professor Dr. Mrinal Chatterjee saying that fake news also remains to be there. And, and he, he made a very important uh, uh, distinction between fake and false news. Every bit of it, I know Mrinal Chatterjee is probably Mrinal Da for us, actually. Uh, that, that's how we feel more comfortable talking to. Um, Mrinal Da probably is wondering, what is it that I have said? And every bit of his words are, are pearls of wisdom, which I, I note, so I'm noted today as well. So fake and false news. Um, it's, it's easily said, but it has to be understood. And, and so um, interestingly, he's woven all of that together. So um, I, I will, again, as I said, I will not attempt at summarization, but I do want to um, uh, take uh, also another important uh, um, uh, interpretation, that to do with the cognitive sciences and somebody in the audience and participant also spoke about audience psychology. Actually, in a behavior change communication, uh, a cognitive science is also appealed to, and there is a certain process through which behaviors are modified and there is a call to action. With infodemic, there is a certain challenge. Even if I want to go and accept a certain uh, service, which is important for me, uh, I, I will probably have to look at another layer and understand whether the current information is correct, whether there is any misinformation or disinformation, and therefore becomes that much more challenging. But these are, these are very important reflections for me also as, as a participant, and I will take them back and try and see how much UNICEF also can address. Thank you very much for being here, and over to um, USP, uh, whom, who is Dr. Pandey to all, but USP to us, and USP to this program also. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm very Thank honored to uh, uh, inform our participants that uh, the Honorable President uh, uh, Press Club Kolkata is also my teacher mm -hmm. and the teacher of one of our panelists here, uh, Dr. Moshini Bhattacharya. So, uh, and he has been our guardian angel in many ways. And uh, I know he doesn't like, uh, you know, when we talk uh, of him in, uh, in uh, this manner, but uh, this wouldn't have been possible without his support, his trust and his confidence in us. So uh, I invite him to uh, deliver the uh, final vote of thanks of uh, the year 2020. It's uh, muted, sir. Still, still muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just did the reverse. I'm sorry. Now I am audible. Yes, sir. This happens with if you become the teacher of such a mature. Uh, professional speakers so you can understand your age and you are going old and then you are 
you are subject to commit these mistakes which uh, you know that you are uh, among some people who are there to correct your mistakes uh, whose mistakes once you corrected in life so that is the you know uh, that that is how the life goes on and since uh, dr pandey has raised this i'll just spend one sentence uh you also have been teaching both of you you and moshumi i'm now uh, allowed to call you in my address you in the, your first names as i always can uh you also have started getting the satisfaction that when you see uh whom you saw on the other side of the high bench uh, are now maturing maturing uh, then the kind of satisfaction the kind of feeling i think uh, minalda is also getting that so that's a different kind of feeling i have mentioned it not that to reciprocate what you have said that's all different we are known to each other but since there are many media students and media academicians in the platform right at the moment i said this parampara this legacy continues that uh, the 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 teachers will get this this is the most important thing that a teacher gets when you see that uh, the ones who saw them uh, sitting uh, with all bright eyes uh, on the other side when he was addressing and now you are listening carefully to the addresses which they are making that kind of satisfaction that's a different feeling i must congratulate both of you for your success not that you have spent a definite number of years in your postgraduate teaching or journalism teaching nationally and internationally but it is how you have matured yourself how you have gone into the subject how you have added values that is what is more important well that could be taken as a personal but i said this because of the fact that there are many people here who are teachers and the students let me just go back uh, yes uh, i consider myself and the press club kolkata to be fortunate to have been able to associate with this kind of a project which was spearheaded by again shucharita i can address her like that because of our old relations on this professional commitment yes the day when as i said the dg director general who uh, remarked that uh, we are now facing infodemic much more than pandemic because infodemic is spreading at a faster than faster rate than the uh, pandemic is spreading so we 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 understood and we took the caution and when the government of india the ministry of home in the evidebit to the court said that it is the major problem which the government is facing in combating the pandemic then the court came out with certain rulings and things like that that is a theoretical perspective but on a day to day basis uh, as we we as uh, shotobroto has rightly referred to that uh, once we on one side we have to chase the deadline and on the uh, other side the credibility is something which is very very important we often talk about the responsibility of the other kind of professionals like doctors like um, chartered accountants like lawyers and other professionals yes each professional has a responsibility to the society but the problem with the journalist responsibility is manifold because our damage the damages met by us knowingly and unknowingly are irreparable that is the major problem if a doctor commits a mistake maybe one person would lose his life if a lawyer commits a mistake maybe one or two persons will not get justice but if a journalist commits a mistake the millions will be misinformed and public opinion will be created with the wrong perspective and wrong actions will take place so truth and truth and objectivity are some things which we have to work on but it's very difficult to achieve 100% with this new speed with the new concept yes there are advantages that we have certain tools of fact checking but there are disadvantages of the speed and second by second deadline so what i began with that we need to be well equipped before entering the profession that how can we fight this problem 
this has not been a webinar to deal with the tools which i have referred to there are fact checking classes and patshalas and things like that which are available and which are done by eminent organizations this is to understand the problem and the seriousness of the problem and the way we need to address them that was the perspective of our webinar today if i have understood correctly and i believe both the eminent speakers have done it well theoretical perspectives academic perspectives international perspectives national perspectives deliverable perspectives so all the perspectives have been dealt in like uh, the impact of uh, fake news firstly the defining of false news and fake news intentional unintentional then the impact that people remember and get attracted to fake news much more than they do with real news then how to distinguish between the two and uh, the other kinds of measures being taken by the government and the other bodies professional bodies and there are social issues which are taking place uh, due to this uh, fake news and uh, inability to fact checking methods and all other things so the mantra of journalism remains over the years when we were students when you as students when and and when the present students are students that facts are sacred comment is free yes it is sacred but we need to understand which is sacred and which is uh, taking a shape of a sacred element but which is not sacred so this distinction to find out the right one is the new challenge which the perspectives have definitely been dealt in and another issue which has cropped up which all of us have identified as a deliverables is the spreading of media literacy since unicef is our partner here definitely among children but largely to the society among the people at large they have to decide which they will do and will they will not go for uh, it is not a thanksgiving session yes we have done so many and we are encouraged by each one and we are grateful not thankful to the speakers that you have added value to this discourse which we are in and i am also grateful to the participants as always i say that if you are not there if you are not engaging uh, there is no purpose of doing it and i must add that entire repository will be there on the social media will be there in the youtube so you can fall back you can uh, again listen to all these discourses and we are trying to also add the add your takeaways by giving you so much of reading material so much of material to fall back because we always believe that someone somewhere in the world is arranging these resources and you all are spending your valuable time so we must be true to these two and we must add to our professional competence and academic domain knowledge so if we are able to do it with our eminent experts speakers and with your participation i think we are doing a little bit which has been mandated to us thank you one and all we really had a tough 2020 personally socially professionally in whichever way may not be that uh, professor chatterji or minalda used to go to kadi for not that's a different i could have added it more authenticity that he has been in kadi and kadi being one of the major universities of this uh, of uh, uh, discussion of uh, mass communication and all that's a different issue yes lot of opportunities have been missed but lot of new opportunities have been made possible we would have not gone for such a thing that people from various places irrespective of their geographical positions could come in together yes we are making a distance but at the same time we are having a togetherness maybe virtual 
and virtual uh, is becoming almost a real you are listening to it at a given point of time all together you are getting all the materials that's physical you can keep it as a pdf form you can get it printed so all these are becoming a substitute to the physical meetings whether good or bad but everything has disadvantages and advantages we have to make opportunities out of the challenges i believe things will definitely change in 2021 but certain advantages which we have taken it in 2020 will continue to be there 2021 and 2021 should be a better with this new advantages and going back to old advantages thank you very much for making this a meaningful whether success or not that's a different issue we'll discuss it later but if it is meaningful we are satisfied thank you very much for giving me the satisfaction at the end of the day that what we are doing we are doing it it's happening something it's, it's something meaningful being done thank you our resource persons thank you our participants thank you shucharita thank you uma thank you uh, thank you thank you so much sir uh, it's it's so encouraging you know to uh, hear you uh, talk about the future and you know what what uh, we're planning for the next uh, year as well so as I, I just to repeat we have shared two very important documents uh, with our participants it will also be mailed to them there's one book on uh, journalism fake news and disinformation that's a handbook for uh, a journalism education and training by the uh, it's, it's uh, a part of the unesco series on journalism education so that's been shared and also uh, professor minal chatterjee has been very generous in sharing that uh, 403 page monograph uh, titled media in the time of covid 19 which has been edited by uh, professor chatterjee himself and it has uh, uh, contributions from uh, from uh, uh, our honorable press club president and also our other panelists so uh, it's it's a very very useful uh, monograph, and I'm so thankful to Professor Chatterjee for sharing. I, uh, we have I just remembered we have also developed a couple of um, SOPs, uh, standard operating uh, procedure, to engage with fake news. So maybe and we have translated it into four or five languages. Uh, I'll send it across to Snayashish Babu and USP. Maybe this also could be uploaded. We, we, we will share that, sir. As I said, we have been sharing uh, all these uh, elements and also a lot of uh, uh, these uh, uh, online discussions. Uh, we uh, uh, we uh, take it to YouTube because even in a post-COVID world, there will be need for you know going back to such resources, which, which will be so handy. So we are, I'm sure, adding to the domain. And uh, as we said, we've uh, already shared two uh, videos, one on uh, cognitive biases and other on storytelling. Just to remind our uh, participants once again that uh, on 5th January, our topic would be anti-human trafficking and child marriage, media's role and responsibilities. So uh, we will be looking forward to your participation on, on the first webinar of our series in the new year. So uh, this old year has been very, very uh, interesting in many ways. There have been some wonderful takeaways and uh, so pleased to, you know, have this on ground and uh, uh, having the participation of so many people and so many things to think about and so many things to look forward to and so many things to uh, plan for. So thank you again, uh, everybody. A special thanks to three very important people uh, behind the show. The webinar uh, coordinator, uh, Ms. Shreya Deb, our IT coordinators, uh, Mr. Uh, Devayan Bhaduri and Ms. Sanjali Ganguly, and also our uh, creative head, Mr. Shekhar Vajpayee. Thank you, everybody, for your support. Thank you, resource persons. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Press Club President, and thank you, Mr. Shrita Bardhan. Looking forward to meeting you all, uh, same time, same place, on 5th January. So uh, let's meet in the new year. Wishing everyone a very, very happy new year. Thank you very much, everybody.